Amen. You guys can grab a seat if you can. My goodness. Can we give it up for the worship team for leading us so well this morning? Whoo, my word. And, and I, I mean, the, the worship, it was incredible. But on a day like this with the sun shining, I could have got up here and led worship and it probably would have sounded good, right? I mean, <laughs> this is it's beautiful outside. We got nice weather. Me and my uh, kids and Jessica, we went and got ice cream yesterday. Biggins Big Dip is open. Can somebody say amen? We got ice cream shops open up. It's March. March Madness is right around the corner. Like, I'm just, I'm in a really good mood. <laughs> Every, everything is up and to the right right now for me. Uh, but man, welcome. I'm so glad you guys are here at Cornerstone worshiping with us today. Welcome to everybody watching us online as well. So glad that you guys are here. Uh, I want to issue a challenge from the onset today. Just a real quick challenge. I want to challenge you to be a bringer. I'm going to challenge you to be a bringer. I want to challenge you to invite friends, family, coworkers. Like I joked with you before, your, your Amazon delivery guy who, who you're on a first name basis with now because you get packages all the time. I want you to be a bringer. So I want you to think this week about someone that you can invite next week to be with you because I'm telling you right now, I know this for a fact, you have someone in your life who needs a good church family. You do. You know someone in your life who needs a good church family. If it's a friend, if it's a neighbor, if it's a coworker, whoever it is, you know somebody. And let me tell you, Cornerstone is a good church family. Somebody in your life needs Cornerstone. So I am challenging you next week to be a bringer, to invite them, to just put that out there. Because this time of year, as we're heading up to Holy Week and getting ready for uh, that season, this is the time. This and Christmas are the two times of year people are most likely to accept an invitation to church. It's the two times a year that people are most likely to be thinking about spiritual things and their own spiritual life. So leverage that. Leverage that advantage and talk to people and see if they would be willing to come with you. Because let me tell you, God is moving in our church, isn't he? God is moving in our church. He is doing things here. And this is the time, if you want to get to be a part of a church, this is the time you want to get in on the ground floor. <laughs> because God is doing something here at Cornerstone. And we have so many exciting things coming up. Uh, like I said, Holy Week isn't too far away. We've got baptisms coming up. If you haven't been baptized before, uh, you can sign up for that. We have child blessings coming up. Uh, we are here now campaign uh, that we're raising money to renovate and construct a new facility right here, which, by the way, can I tell you, we are approaching the $400,000 raised mark. How incredible is that? Uh, man, just so many awesome things going on. Like I said, this is the time that you want to get involved here at Cornerstone. So Easter, we are only 42 days out from Easter. And we are starting this series today, How God Became King. And this series will run this week all the way through Easter Sunday. Now, this series is based on a book. Uh, I'm, I'm taking a lot of stuff from this book. This is uh, N.T. Wright who wrote this book, How God Became King. If you want to know more, go further in depth on what I'm going to be preaching over the next seven weeks. Uh, if you want to hear it put way better, then I'll put it. Um, if you want to have it explained in a way smarter way, then I'll explain it. I highly recommend you get this book. It's actually a really easy read. And let me tell you, it blew my mind the first time I read it, blew my mind the second time I read it, and it's been blowing my mind as I've been reading it for a third time preparing for this sermon series. So the whole thrust of the book and the whole thrust of the sermon series that we're talking about is this idea that Jesus is king. Amen? Jesus is king, but here, here's where the disconnect happens. He's not king in some, like, theoretical sense. He's not king in some Christian sense where we're like, oh, yeah, Jesus is king of my life, but nobody else. And No, no. Jesus is currently king of the world. Even people who are not recognizing him as their king, Jesus is king king. Now, the problem is most of us who call ourselves Christians either don't know that to be true or don't live like that's true, right? So we have a disconnect here that we have got to address, and that's exactly what we're going to be addressing throughout this series. Um, I want to start us off by reading from John chapter 13. Uh, the picture in scripture we're about to read is one of the most beautiful you'll find anywhere in the Bible. Uh, this scene that plays out is just a scene of, of love, the love that Jesus has for his friends and for his followers. This is what it says. We're going to read verses 1 through 15 and then verses 34 and 35. John writes, before the Passover celebration, 
Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything, and that he had come from God and would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. Then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. It's not what you would expect, right? We just read that Jesus had realized, had, 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 had come to know that in this moment, the Father had given him all power and authority. And because of that, he decides to stoop down and wash his disciples' feet. What a model, what a picture for the rest of us. Verse 6 continues, when Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing, but someday you will. No, Peter protested, you will never, ever wash my feet. Jesus replied, unless I wash you, you won't belong to me. Simon Peter exclaimed, then wash my hands and head as well, Lord, not just my feet. I love Peter. This is an all-in kind of guy, right? He's like, you're never going to wash my feet. Never, Lord, never. Jesus is like, well, then you won't belong to me. Okay, then you're going to wash not just my feet, but my hands and my head and everything, right? He's just an all-in kind of guy. Uh, Verse 10, Jesus replies to Peter, a person who has bathed all over does not need to wash except for the feet to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him, and that is what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. After washing their feet, he put his robe on again and sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. Verse 34, so now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another, will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So today, if you're a note taker, what we're going to be calling today's sermon is between the cradle and the cross. Between the cradle and the cross. Has anyone ever heard of the term C and E only Christians? C and E only Christmas and Easter only, right? Christmas and Easter, the only time we, we see people is at Christmas and Easter. I've heard them called Christians, right? Christmas and Easter, Christians. Um, we love those people, right? We, they're like distant cousins that we only see at a few family functions throughout the year, but we still love them, right? They're still, they're still part of the family. Uh, but it is funny being a pastor because it's, it's very easy. Pastorals, we have carnal sides, right? We have carnal sides. And so whenever I see someone who's a C&E only Christian out and about, like I see him at Target or anything like that, I'm not like wanting to dip behind an aisle so they don't see me. I'm like, oh, I want to go kind of make this uncomfortable for him. Go walk up and be like, hey, how was church last week? Just see, just see what they do. Like, oh, it was great. I was there. Like, no, you weren't. You're lying. It's too small of a building. I know who's here and who's not. Like, I know you weren't here, right? Um, there's, there's that carnal part of me. I don't do it, though. I don't do it. I don't say it. I don't, I don't put people on the spot or anything like that. Uh, And one of the main reasons I don't, you know, God gives me these moments of self-reflection where he's like, hey, listen up, hits me over the head. Um, And I I have one of these whenever it comes to uh, uh, people coming only at Christmas and Easter, and I kind of realize, man, I can't be, I can't be upset at people for that because that's what we prioritize at church, right? Not just church as in Cornerstone Church, but church as in the capital C, big church. That's what we prioritize. So I can't be upset if people only respect what I've only prioritized, right? How silly is that? For me to be upset, well, you only come on Christmas and Easter, where are you the rest of the year? And they're like, yeah, because the way you portray it is that Christmas and Easter are the only things that really matter, right? We pull out all the stops. We send out mailers. We're like, hey, invite everybody, invite everybody. We have like blow up stuff for the kids, and we have all these different cool things, and we got everything going on on those two dates, and then everything between there is just kind of like, eh, well. But make sure you come for Christmas. Make sure you come for Easter. So no wonder, right? 
No wonder people really invest in those times of year and nothing else. No wonder people prioritize the only thing that we've prioritized. This is an issue in the church. We have a huge, massive, ginormous focus on the cradle and the cross, on Christmas and Easter. And I get it. Like, kind of important moments in our faith, wouldn't you say? Like, I think I, I, I understand. I understand why there's been such a big emphasis. Um, but here's the thing. It's not even a modern emphasis. It's very easy to think that, oh, okay, yeah, well, that's what modern churches have done. We're all trying to be seeker sensitive. We're all trying to reach people. And so we create these big campaigns around these big holidays to try to get people to come in. No, no, no. Christmas and Easter have been the main things pretty much as long as the Christian faith has been around. We've been leaving stuff out between the cradle and the cross as long as we can Remember, um, the Nicene Creed. Does anyone know what that is? The Nicene Creed? If you grew up in a Catholic church or a liturgical church, you know what I'm talking about. I had someone, uh, Sarah, in between services talking to me. She said, man, you brought me right back to my Episcopalian church that I grew up in whenever we were talking about this in first service. The Nicene Creed, it's a creedal statement that uh, uh, the Christian church came up with at the Council of Nicaea back in the 300s. So very, very long time ago, very early in the Christian faith, uh, this creed is a statement that the church fathers and church leaders all agreed upon to say, hey, we're going to create this statement that could kind of serve as guardrails for the Christian church, so that we can say, if you believe these things, you're a Christian. This is, this is what we have to be staunchly united on, are on these matters. And so they formed uh, the Nicene Creed. I'm going to read you just part of it here. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to read the section that focuses on Jesus because there's a few sections of it. This is the section that focuses on Jesus. Don't shout it out, but I just want you to be noticing in your head, just thinking to yourself if there is uh, something that stands out to you that you notice as we read through this. This is what it says. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary, and he was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. Beautiful stuff. I agree with all of it, by the way. But did you notice something's missing? Did you notice that? Let me, let me just read this one more time. Um, for us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Very next line. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. Cradle to cross. Cradle to cross. We just, we jump right over everything in the middle. It's like it didn't even happen, right? It's like it didn't even happen. I mean, for goodness sakes, Pontius Pilate got mentioned in here, but none of Jesus' ministry got mentioned. Seems a little weird, right? So if you're a rational person and you're thinking this out, you're going, okay, well, if the Christian uh, uh, fathers decided we didn't need to have the middle in here. Do we need the middle in here? Does it really matter? Like, does it matter? Well, ask your neighbor. Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter? Um, yeah. It matters. <laughs> the middle matters. The middle is huge. It's massive. It matters so much to our faith. Of course it matters. Look at what we just read again. This is John uh, chapter 13, verse 1. Before Passover celebration, Jesus knew his hour had come to leave this world and return to his Father. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. He had loved his disciples during his ministry on earth. Do you know that love is the highest ethic in the Christian faith? John, the very same John who wrote this, uh, this book of Scripture, he would also go on to say, God is love. That God, at his core essence, that's who he is. He is love. And so the highest ethic in the Christian faith is love. And what John's saying here in verse 1 is that during his ministry, Jesus loved his disciples. He loved them, and he was getting ready to love them to the very end. 
And so what we get is this picture of Jesus during all of this middle, all of this from the cradle to the cross, loving people, exhibiting the highest ethic of the Christian faith. How in the world does that not matter? Of course it does. Of course Jesus living out love matters. You see, we cannot miss the ministry of Jesus for the miracles of Jesus. If, if we miss the ministry of Jesus, what he did in that in-between, if we miss the ministry of Jesus for the miracles of Jesus, the whoa, the virgin birth, and whoa, the death and resurrection, if we miss the ministry of Jesus for the miracles of Jesus, we miss Jesus. We miss him entirely. We cannot just jump from the cradle to the cross. We will miss Jesus. His disciples, can I tell you, they missed him all the time. They missed him all the time. His miracles, they didn't forget those, right? They didn't forget how he, how he did things. In fact, we see different parts in Scripture where they know Jesus has the ability to do miracles. James and John, at one moment when they're with Jesus, uh, some, some guys start calling them names, start putting them down. And James and John tell Jesus, man, call down thunder and lightning to kill these guys like for what, what they're doing to us and what they're saying about us. They knew about Jesus' miracles, but Jesus had to constantly remind them about his ministry. You see over and over and over again throughout the gospel narratives where the disciples are going, now what's he saying? What's that parable mean? He's telling us he's going to die, but we don't, we don't understand that that can't be. what they, they constantly were missing the ministry for the miracles. We can't be there. We can't be there as a church. If we miss the ministry of Jesus for the miracles of Jesus, we will miss Jesus. And let me tell you, the ministry matters. I'm going to prove it to you, all right? So here we go. I'm not, you don't want me doing your taxes. I'm not good with math, but we're going to work some simple math here today. Simple addition, so I should be able to do this, all right? So the Gospels, the Gospels are the four first books of the New Testament. Four separate accounts from four different men who were writing about their encounters with Jesus. Or in the uh, 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 Luke's situation, he was someone who interviewed people who had known about the gospel story. And so we have these four books. They record the gospel narrative, Jesus' life, death, resurrection, all of it. Um, and I want us to see how much of the gospels focus on the cradle and the cross. Because we have such a huge emphasis on it. It's the only thing that matters, right? You just got to believe Jesus was born of a virgin and believe he died for your sins, and that's it. That's all that really matters, right? So let's, let's do some math. So um, in the book of Matthew, we have two chapters because, the, right, the Bible's divided into books. The books are divided into chapters. The chapter's divided into verses. So let's see how many chapters of the Gospels are dedicated to the cradle and the cross. So we've got two in Matthew that go towards the cradle, two about Jesus' birth. Mark Mark, remarkably enough, doesn't discuss Jesus' birth at all. It just jumps right into his ministry. So we have zero from the book of Mark. The book of Luke has two, so we'll add two more on. Um, but then the book of John, same thing. Doesn't talk about Jesus' birth at all. Just jumps right in to his ministry. So four. <laughs> Got four chapters so far that deal with Jesus' birth, with the cradle. What about the cross? Well, there's some more. Matthew. Matthew's... Uh, verses 26, 27, and 28. Mark, chapters 14, 15, and 16. Luke, chapters 22, 23, 24. And John, chapters 18, 19, and 20. So that takes us up to, boom, 16. It's a lot, right? 16. Four chapters talking about Jesus' birth. 12 chapters talking about Jesus' death and resurrection, Right? So we've got a total of 16 verses that are 16 chapters that focus on the cradle and the cross. What about everything else? Well, here's how many chapters we have in the entirety of the Gospels. Still going. I wish I was a little bit taller. This would be easier for me. There we go. We have a total of 89 chapters in the Gospels. I'm, I'm barely holding on to this bad boy. There we go. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you guys think the middle matters? Do you think the middle matters? Or is this just filler? Needed something to put in between the, the start and the climax, right? We just needed something to fill the story, needed something to go in here. Or does this stuff matter and we're just skipping over a lot of really important stuff? Yeah, this matters. This matters. Obviously, 
it matters. Obviously, Jesus' followers and people who interviewed people who had been around Jesus, obviously, they're including this stuff because it's important, because it's vital, because if you don't read it, if you don't understand it, if you don't absorb it, you are missing the overarching story that's being told. You know what that equals out to, the, the 16 chapters? That equals out to 17, or 18%. 18% of the Gospels focus on the cradle and the cross, 18%. That means 82% focus on the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. And somehow, we overlook it. <laughs> somehow, it's just filler. Somehow, it gets second rank to the cradle and the cross. That cannot be. Because when we do that, we miss Jesus. We miss Jesus. That whole middle section, you want to know what that is? That is the laying the foundations of the kingdom. That's the establishment of the kingdom of God. And what we do when we ignore all that stuff and just focus on the two big miraculous moments, when we ignore all of that middle, what we try to do is we try to follow the king but forget the kingdom. We're, we're trying to say, oh, yeah, I, if I follow Jesus, I follow Jesus, but all that other stuff, eh, whatever. I, you know, that's, that's whatever. Um, we cannot be there. This is what this looks like. This happens, and it has happened all throughout Christian history. People forget the middle, ignore the middle, focus on the miraculous moments that show Jesus is God, and they forget the middle. And what happens is we change Jesus into our own likeness. We, we, we follow a king without the kingdom. We see this early on, uh, the Christian faith. Honestly, the worst thing that happened to the Christian faith was it was legalized. It's the worst thing that happened to us. We are terrible. Can I just say, we're terrible with power. It's not good whenever we're given power and handled, handled uh, the levers of power. We don't do good with it. We don't do good with it. And we see that time and time and time again through Christian history, through church history, Christianity was legalized after Constantine, uh, the emperor of Rome, had this big conversion moment. We don't know if he really had a conversion or if he mostly just realized, wow, there's a lot of Christians in my empire. And if I make this religion official and make it our official religion, I can consolidate power better. We don't know what happened there. But Constantine legalized Christianity. It became the official uh, religion of the Roman Empire, essentially. And what happened is Christians suddenly were thrust into the halls of power, and what we started to do was follow a king and forget the kingdom. And so what we see, don't take my word for this, do, do a Google search on your own. Look for images and depictions of Jesus around 500 AD, when people would, would make murals and paint on walls. The Jesus that you see after Christianity was legalized, during a lot of these uh, centuries to follow, is a Jesus who wears the exact same suit of armor that Caesar wore. He's carrying a sword instead of a cross. Because that's what we need. We need a military Jesus, a Jesus who will help us go and conquer. We'll fight under his cross as our sword, and we will take over all of the pagans, and we'll put them to death. We created him in our own image because we followed a king, but we forgot the kingdom. And we still do it to this day. We still do it to this day. We still fight under the king, but it's not the king. It's our king. It's what we want Jesus to look like. It's the Jesus that hates the people we hate. It's a Jesus that's okay with us othering the people that we want to other. That's the king that we make in his place. We're following our own king, not the king. We cannot follow a king but forget his kingdom. We can't do it. We can't do it because then we just follow a Jesus of our own making rather than a Jesus who revealed himself with self-sacrificing love. This is what the kingdom looks like. Again, this is verse 12 of chapter 13 of John. After washing their feet, Jesus put on his robe again and he sat down and asked, do you understand what I was doing? What I like to imagine is that Jesus isn't in this moment just talking about washing their feet. I think Jesus is talking about his entire ministry. Jesus knows in about 12 hours he's going to be hanging on a cross. And in his last moments with his followers before he's going to his death, Jesus is like, guys, I just, do you understand what I've been doing? No, not just the foot washing. That, that is a symbolic summary of everything I've been doing for you. For the last three years, 
I've constantly been lowering myself, humbling myself, emptying myself to serve you in a self-sacrificing way. Guys, do you understand that what I'm doing is laying the foundations of a new kingdom? This is the way it will be for you. This is, this is how it will be for everyone who, who, who follows me, who makes me the king and the Lord of their life. Jesus was laying the foundations of the kingdom. And we cannot follow the king without those foundations of the kingdom, without that self-sacrificing love at the center. You know, it hit me uh, yesterday. I was, because we have our Saturday services, I was finishing up my sermon prep, and I actually completely reworded like the last 10 minutes of my sermon. I just completely trashed it uh, and wrote something new because I, I felt God kind of putting on my heart. Um, j- just, okay, so earlier, earlier in the sermon, I mentioned that one of the main reasons I feel like people focus so much on the cradle and the cross is because that's what we prioritize as a church. That's, those are the big dates. But there is another reason. There is another reason I think that not just the Christian church, but the whole world gravitates, even people who don't call themselves uh, followers of Jesus, we all gravitate towards Christmas and Easter. And please hear me in these last moments. I'm not preaching at you. I'm preaching with you. I'm talking to myself in these moments. But I think one of the big drives towards this hyper focus on the cradle and the cross, on Christmas and Easter, and the whole kingdom stuff, yeah, yeah, that's, that's great, but it's not necessary. Just kind of brush off to the side. I think one of the reasons we do that is because the cradle and the cross, if we're being real and if we're being honest to ourselves, they're about us. We inject ourselves into that story. At Christmas time, what did Jesus do? He came and he was born for me. <laughs> the star of the show. At, at, at Easter, on Good Friday, Good Friday, Jesus died for me. And on Easter Sunday, Jesus rose from the dead for me. Because <laughs> I'm the star. Because I'm the headliner. I'm the name that's up on the marquee. It's about me. It's very easy to fall into that. It's very easy to look at these stories, to look at those moments and think they're just about us. But they're not. They're not. We want them to be. We, we, and maybe that's why we try to skip to the good part, right? Because Christmas is about me, and then the cross is about me. So let's just skip all that middle stuff because we don't really need it. Let's just get to the good part, right? You ever do that with a movie before? There's a scene you don't like? Eh, just fast forward it. I don't, wanna, I don't like this part. Let's get on <laughs> to the next thing. Um, my, my mom is actually, she's been watching the Marvel series, the MCU. She started and had never seen one before. Started them back in January. I made a list for her, for her to start watching these things to knock them off. I made the list, and I'm like, all right, it's January. It's like first week of January. She'll probably, yeah, she should finish this like just in time for the new one. Doctor Strange, the Multiverse of Madness. It comes out in May. I'm like, this will be perfect. She'll probably finish just in time for whenever that movie comes out. Man, it's the first week of March, and she's got like two movies left, and that's it. She's just been plowing through <laughs> these things, just, just killing them. Um, but one thing that she's on right now, she, she's watching the What If series. Now, the What If series, it's the only series in the MCU that's animation. It's like a, it's like a cartoon. It's really cool-looking animation, very uh, unique, but it is animation. And I knew it would be hard for her because it's a cartoon. Like, I knew it would be like, well, this just feels different. I knew she'd probably have moments where she's like, why am I... Why am I watching a cartoon if there's no grandkids in the house? This feels weird, (laughs) like I'm a grown adult watching a cartoon right now. Um, But I told her, like, I know you might feel that way, but you got to watch them. You got to watch them. You can't just skip over to the next movie. And the reason is, is the guy who is, like, mapping this whole thing out, Kevin Fahey, he's the director at Marvel. He's mapping everything out. He's got the next, like, 20 movies planned. It's ridiculous. He came out before What If was released, and he told everybody, hey, I just want to let you know, I know animation may not be some people's thing, but these, this, this series, these episodes, they will be integral to the movies coming out. The main MCU, if, if, if you want to know what's going on, you've got to watch these. They may not be your cup of tea. You may feel like, well, animation isn't really for me. But if you don't watch these, there's a very good chance you'll go into the theater to watch the next movie, Stuff will happen, a character will be introduced, and everyone else in the theater will be like, oh, yeah, yeah. And you'll be sitting there going, who's that? Like, how, what's going on? How do they know him? 
What happened? I, I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm missing something. And it's because you are. Because you see, this series, it's, it's, it's made for you, but it's not about you. It's telling an overarching story. And in a much greater, amazing way, the Gospels, I want to tell you, they're not about you. They're not your story. They're not your guidebook to living your best version of you. Like, that's not what the Bible is. Has anyone ever heard the acronym B-I-B-L-E? What it means is basic instructions before leaving earth, amen? Right, you ever hear, you ever hear that one? That ain't it. Like, the, the, the Bible is God's story. The Bible is the story of how God has become king and how he has rescued rebellious people time and time again through his love and through his mercy. That's what the Bible is. That's what the Gospels are. They're not about us, but they are for us. They're not about us, but they are for us. So if they were just about us, then sure, we can go ahead and skip to just the parts that we like. But if they're for us, that means it's not just the cradle and the cross, but it's everything in between matters. And it's integral to the story, and we can't skip it because if we do, we miss it. We miss Jesus. And it's so tempting to skip those parts, isn't it? Man, we love baby Jesus, don't we? Oh, sweet little, sweet little eight pound, six ounce baby God <laughs> sitting in your little manger. We love, <laughs> we love that Jesus because he's cute and cuddly and he's just, oh, and we get presents and it's great. We love that Jesus and we love saving Jesus. We love the Jesus that just saves us from our sins and man, isn't that so great? And we'll sing worship songs about it. We love those Jesuses, we love the Jesus we find at the cradle, and we love the Jesus we find at the cross and the empty tomb. We love those Jesuses, but man, that, that Jesus in the middle that talks about enemy love, ooh. that Jesus who, who commands me, commands me to love people who vote differently than me the way he loved me. The Jesus who, who, who commands me to love people that I am so diametrically opposed to in almost every area of life, I need to love them with the same self-sacrificing love that Jesus showed to me. Can we skip that part? Can we just cradle to cross? Like, do we, do we really, man, do we really need that? Do we really need the Jesus that says, hey, 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 why are you worried about sawdust in someone else's eye when you have a log sticking out of your own not, not love the sinner, hate the sin. Love the sinner, hate your sin. Focus on getting yourself holy. Focus on getting yourself into my will for your life. That Jesus is a Jesus we're like, Ooh, yeah, let's just get to the end of the book. Let's just, let's skip. I want to skip the self-sacrificing Jesus and just stay with the baby Jesus. Just stay with the saving Jesus. But we can't do that. Because the stuff between the cradle and the cross is as much for us as the cradle and the cross is. It's all for us. So yes, when we read in the gospel, Jesus say, hey, today you'll be with me in paradise. Yep, that's for us. But also when Jesus says, today you need to pick up your cross and follow me and die to yourself, that's for us too. The whole counsel is for us. All of it is for us. And if we try to skip it, we miss Jesus. We miss Jesus. We cannot make it about us. If we make it about us, what we get is a king without the kingdom. We get miracles without ministries. And we get an empty tomb without the occupied cross. We need the whole story that the gospels are telling, every single bit of it. We need it. We need the story of how God became king and what it means for us, because it does mean something for us. If you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you see the story of how God became king. You cannot walk away from it feeling indifferent, that Jesus just did something for you. It's an invitation for you to join in what he is doing. It means something for you. It means something for us. And we need to know it. We need to know it, because if we don't know it, we miss it. And again, we create Jesus in our own image. The disciples did this, the disciples, they had a different idea of what the kingdom was going to look like. They had a different idea of what kind of king Jesus would be. They didn't want a king that was riding in on a donkey. They wanted a king that was riding in on a horse. They didn't want a king that was going to lay out his arms to be killed. They wanted a king who was going to raise arms to overthrow the Roman oppressor. That's what they wanted. That's what they were looking for. They were following a king of their own making. But if they had been listening to Jesus' ministry, they would have realized 
that's, that's our own Jesus. That's not the Jesus. He's about something totally different. He's about self-sacrificing love. That's what his kingdom is going to be founded upon. And so his disciples wanted an earthly kingdom. They wanted Jesus to overthrow the Romans and usher in the kingdom of God. And Jesus is saying, man, don't you guys understand what I've been doing? Don't you understand what I've been up to? I have already ushered in this kingdom. This new way of living, it's, it's not off in the future. It's here and it's now and it's right now and I'm inviting you into it. We're gonna talk more about this next week so I'm not gonna dive too much into it. I'm just gonna tease this out a little bit. You see, the disciples made a, a, an error that we make to this day. The kingdom of God is not a place to go to and we think it is. We read scripture and we see, oh, see, like this says, uh, people like this won't inherit the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not heaven. That's not what the Bible is talking about when it talks about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not a place to go to or a place to usher in. It's a new reality to live in. That's what the kingdom of God is. And so that's why we can say Jesus is already king of the world. He's already ushered in this new reality and this new way of living. The disciples missed it. We miss it. We can't miss it anymore. We can't miss it anymore. This new way of living, this new life, this new kingdom that Jesus ushered in, this is exactly what it looks like. John 13, verses 34 through 35. So now I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world you are my disciples. That is the kingdom foundation in two verses. That's Jesus' ministry in two verses. Love others as I have loved you. That's the middle. That's the middle that we miss if we just focus on the cradle and the grave. That's all this extra stuff that we miss if we just skip to the parts that make us feel comfortable and are easy to read. But it is the heart of the kingdom of God, self sacrificing to the end love. That's what Jesus modeled throughout his entire ministry and he rubber stamped it on the cross. The cross was just a culmination of what he had been doing for years and years at that point. Self-sacrificing love. Man, don't we take that for granted nowadays? We just take it for granted. Jesus ushered in a completely new way of thinking. But back then, prior to Jesus, Self-sacrificing love was not a thing. You can't find it in antiquity. You can't find it in ancient history. It was not a value. It was not something that people placed a priority on. You were seen as weak if you did this. You were seen as less than if you did this. Nowadays, we just take it for granted. Uh, uh, I was talking with Pastor Brenda, and she was mentioning how what's going on in Ukraine with Russia. We take for granted the fact that all of us are opposed to what's going on and that we're all pulling for the Ukrainian government. We take that for granted. That's not how things used to be. That's right. How things used to be was, hey, Russia wants more power. Mm, good on them. If they can do it, might is right. That's how things used to be. Right. Now, since Jesus came, the collective world is looking at this and going, something is just wrong about this. I don't even, I don't even know the ge geopolitical uh, things that are going on at play here, but I know this is wrong. It's because we're living in a new kingdom. Right. Even people who don't bow their knee to Jesus are living in his new kingdom and they don't even know it. Yeah. That thing that's telling them this is wrong, that's the kingdom of God. Yeah. We see it in movies and in books. We see books like Harry Potter where Harry sacrifices himself, where his mom sacrifices itself. We see it like stuff in the MCU where Tony sacrifices himself. We see it time and time again where people Self-sacrifice. It's in story after story. People don't even know, but they are echoing the truth of the kingdom of God. That self-sacrificing love is what our world runs on right now. It's what we yearn for. It's what we need. That's the kingdom of God, and that's what Jesus has ushered in, and it's what he invites us into, to being kingdom ambassadors who will take self-sacrificing love into every situation we find ourselves I want to pray for you. Let's bow our heads real quick. Heavenly Father, thank you for your kingdom. Thank you for the kingdom that Jesus instituted during his earthly ministry here, self-sacrificing and loving everyone to the very end. 
God, we thank you that that kingdom didn't go away, but it was fully inaugurated by Jesus' death on the cross. And now that he has risen in power, you have validated him and you invite us to join in with what you're doing in the world and spreading your kingdom into every single place, every single workplace, every single school, every single home, every single marriage, every single relationship. God, we get to be your kingdom ambassadors to show and to example to the rest of the world what this new way of living looks like. So that whenever people encounter us and they realize how different things are for us, we can say it's because of our king. It's because of who I follow. God, help us to be your kingdom ambassadors. Help us to take your name and to carry your banner into every single place that we go. And we will give you and you alone all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. We love you, Father. We pray all this in your name. Amen.